Welcome to lesson 14 of the Deeper Christian Bible Study Series in the book of Ephesians. Today we're going to look at verses 7 and 8 of chapter 1. Now, verse 7 begins a brand new section within this larger blessing section. So verses 7 through 12 look specifically at the blessings that we have in the Son. Now, this is what verse 7 and 8 says. Paul writes, In him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. Two of the blessings that Paul says that we have in Christ is redemption and forgiveness. Now, in order for us to truly understand these two aspects of the work of Jesus, we must first understand the problem that we have. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. And Romans 3.23 clarifies and says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 reminds us, For the wages of sin is death. Uh, you have a job and you go down to your employer and you say, Hey, I did my job, I need my paycheck. And you are demanding a wage. Isn't it interesting that just as we would demand a wage in our, in our jobs, so too sin demands a wage. And what is the wage that it is offered? Or what, what wage does sin have? Well, it's the wage of death. In other words, if you sin, the penalty of that sin is death. And you recognize that you, in and of yourself, have nothing to pay that off. See, Isaiah in chapter 64, verse 6, says that even the very best that we can pull off in our own strength or our own wisdom, talent, or power is but filthy rags. That, that in and of ourselves, we do not have that which is available or, or needed for righteousness. And you don't have to go very far in God's law to recognize that we indeed are sinners. In fact, just look at the Ten Commandments. And just even look at even a few of them. Uh, the Ten Commandments says that if you lie... Even if you commit one lie, you are a liar. And I don't know about you, but growing up, I said a lot of lies. Uh, Jesus said that if you lust, you are committing adultery. And adultery is one of the big ten. And if you've committed adultery, hey, you have sinned. Which means that even if you've only had one lustful thought, you have committed adultery. Uh, if, you, if you've stolen anything, you recognize that it doesn't matter the amount it doesn't have to be big things like, well, I robbed a bank or I, you know, I took a car. Even if you just stole something small like a piece of bubble gum, you recognize that you are a thief. And that, just one little sin, is enough to send you to hell for eternity. Do you recognize that, that we're not just talking, well, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. This is, do you realize that sin is so intense that even one little sin is enough to send you to hell for eternity? And you can walk through the Ten Commandments and, and realize that, that I have fallen short of God's plan and his purpose and his law and his glory. Uh, Paul in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21, tells us that the works of the flesh are revealed. Or in other words, that they're obvious. And then he begins to list the works of the flesh. He says, listen to this. And of course, they're all sin. Adultery, sexual immorality, impurity, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, rage, selfishness, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you, says Paul, as I previously warned you, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And you say, well, it's, it was just one little sin. <laughs> yeah. But that one little sin is enough to send you and I to hell for eternity. Do you recognize that? Well, I, I, yeah, I give a lie. I, yeah, I said a lie. It was years ago. It's just one little white lie. Oh, I'm condemned. And here we are drowning in sin, destined for hell, no hope in our own abilities, as Isaiah says. Yet, despite our position in sin and our rebellion, our shaking our fists in God's face, isn't it interesting that God still longed to have relationship and intimacy with us? Do you see how crazy that is? See, what kind of right, uh, relationship can righteousness have with unrighteousness? Or, or what does light have to do with darkness? Or how can a holy and righteous God have a relationship with a human who lives in sin? See, something has to change in order for humanity to have relationship with God. And yet God couldn't just simply speak 
are sent away. See, sin against God demands life. Leviticus 17.11 says that life is in the blood and thus a blood atonement from a perfect sacrifice must be made in order for forgiveness to take place. So here we are in our state of sin and we ourselves cannot be that sacrifice for we are unholy and unblemished and unrighteous. In the Old Testament, see, God gave the Israelites a sacrificial system to remind them of their sins and to point toward the redemption and the sacrifice of Jesus. So see, every year they would offer hundreds of bulls and goats and sheep for atonement, but it was always temporary. The writer of Hebrews says that, for the law is a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of those things. It could never, by those same sacrifices, which they offer continually year after year, perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, once purified, could no longer be conscious of sins? But in those sacrifices, there is an annual reminder of sins, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. But think about this. In Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice, the writer of Hebrew declares, but Christ, when he came as a high priest of the good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption, For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. Do you see that our sin necessitates and and demands the cross? It demanded the death of Christ if we are to be forgiven and set free from the bondage of sin. See, you and I have a problem called sin, and it separates us from God. And the wages of that sin is death. Yet, with the overwhelming love, Jesus offers us redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us. Now, it's interesting that the words forgiveness and redemption, they both contain this idea of being released from bondage and and imprisonment. See, the word forgiveness, this, this idea that we've been forgiven of our sins or trespasses, is the idea of being pardoned of sin. It's, it's letting them go and being removed. It's, it's erasing the records as if they've never been committed. See, it's the cancellation of a debt and a penalty. Do you realize how amazing this is? See, the Bible tells us in Psalm 103 verse 12 that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Isaiah 38, 17 says that you have kept my soul from the pit of corruption for you have cast all my sins behind your back. And Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, says God, am he who blots or wipes out your transgressions for my own sake and I will not remember your sins. Nehemiah says of God, that you are a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in kindness and did not forsake them. And Daniel 9, 9 says, to the Lord our God belongs mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. And Micah 7, 19 declares that he will again have compassion upon us. He will tread down our iniquities and cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. I love what Corey Tim Boom says about this. She says that, that God would take our sins and throw them into the depths of the seas, and then he puts up a sign that says, no fishing allowed. Isn't that great? Do you see that you have been forgiven from sin? Which is why it's a mockery of the death and the life of Jesus to continue in our sin. That, that, that you are no longer as you once were. See, sin no longer is to define you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is, is in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
See, a line has been drawn in the sand, and who you once were before Christ is no longer you. Yes, you may look the same and smell the same, but you are not the same because you are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Why? Because you are forgiven. So again, forgiveness is this idea of being pardoned or, or the cancellation of debt and, and the penalty of sin. But Paul also says that, that you have been redeemed, that you have redemption through the blood of Jesus. Now, redemption is this idea of being set free from captivity through the payment of a ransom. See, if someone gets captured and their captors leave a ransom note, they're saying, well, if they don't get paid, well, the person's going to be harmed or killed. We can actually see this in the book of Exodus. Here are the children of Israel captive and slaves in Egypt. Well, what set them free? Get this. It was by the blood of the Passover lamb, whose blood was smeared upon the doorposts of their houses. And it was because of the blood of this lamb that the Israelites left the slavery of Egypt for the freedom of the promised land. <laughs> now, granted, it did take them a little while to get there due to, due to their disobedience in the wilderness. But take that and apply it to our lives. See, due to sin, we too have become captive to sin. And sin demands a ransom payment. Now, we've already said this, but that ransom must be paid by life. It's by blood. Now, Jesus on the cross as our perfect Passover lamb shed his blood that we might be ransomed from the power and the hold of sin and death. We too have been set free from our slavery to sin, which is a picture of Egypt, that we might experience freedom and life in the land of promise. See, you in Christ have been redeemed and you have been set free from sin. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, Jesus explained his purpose for coming to earth. And he said this, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, if you want to study this idea of redemption and ransom a bit further, I encourage you to study the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. It is not only a beautiful love story, but it is a Christophany. It's a picture of Jesus. See, here is Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, who rescues Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. But I'll leave that for you to study out on your own. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, Peter writes, For you know that you were not redeemed from your vain way of life, inherited from your fathers with perishable things like silver and gold, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The ESV translates it this way, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. Now take all of that and come to Romans chapter 6. Doesn't it make sense why Paul would ask the question in verse 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may increase? God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? See, if you truly have been forgiven and redeemed, why would you go back to the very thing that causes to be slaves and captives? Now, Paul continues into verse 6 and he says, Knowing this, that our old man or our old life has been crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That word they're destroyed, sometimes translated abolished, is this idea of to render ineffective or idle or useless or ineffective or put an end to or put to rest. And see, there's this idea that, that, hey, sin no longer is to have a place in your life. That, hey, it has been abolished. That, that old man has been crucified with Christ. And Paul continues this idea in verse 12, and he says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you shall obey it in its lusts. See, do not let sin have kingly authority. Do not let sin reign, have a position or a voice in your life. Then Paul makes one of my favorite statements. He says, Do not yield your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but yield yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead, and your bodies to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, 
but under grace. Paul says that you are not to yield yourself over to sin. Hey, you are not to just hand yourself freely over to sin. And there's this idea that sin, if you are in Christ, sin cannot touch you. See, the only way that sin's ever going to touch you is if you willingly yield yourself over to sin. See, when you put the noose around your own neck, when you put the, the little nose ring and you put the rope between it, just like, the, you know, they would lead bulls away. Hey, when you put the, no, the ring in your nose and put the rope in it and hand the rope over to sin and say, sin, do what you want with me. Hey, see, when you yield yourself over to sin, sin will take you and do what he wants with you. But do you recognize that in Christ, sin cannot touch you. And Paul says, do not yield yourself over to sin. Because if you do, if you yield yourself to sin, sin is going to take you as an instrument. It's actually, in the, in the Greek, this idea of a weapon of warfare. That sin is going to take you as a weapon of warfare and march out into your world and just produce unrighteousness. Paul says, rather, yield, hand yourself over to God. And you know what God's going to do? He's going to take you as an instrument, a weapon of warfare, march out into your world and just produce righteousness. See, isn't it interesting that, that you and I do not get a choice of whether or not we yield? We will yield to someone. Uh, you and I do not get a choice of whether we're going to be a weapon of warfare, this massive sword. See, we are a weapon of warfare. See, the choice that we have is whom are we going to yield to? And if I yield myself to sin, sin's going to take me and produce unrighteousness in my world. But if I would yield myself to God, God will take me as a weapon of warfare, march me out into my world, and just produce righteousness. And of course, you can say, well, uh, the, the sin that I do, nobody knows about. See, it no, it's, it's, it's a hidden secret sin. See, that is not true. See, you cannot sin in a vacuum. Why? Because every time you yield yourself over to sin, sin will take your life, grab you by the neck, use you as a weapon of warfare, march you out into your world, and just produce unrighteousness. Do you realize that your sin is really causing just destruction and unrighteousness in your family? It's producing destruction and unrighteousness in, you know, in your church and in your community, in your nation, in your world. And you're like, well, nobody knows about it. That doesn't matter. Because when we yield ourselves over to sin, it is beginning to produce unrighteousness through us. But what would it look like? If you and I were forgiven and redeemed from sin, that you and I had our lives smack dab in the middle of Jesus, and that we were continually yielding ourselves over to him, and he would use us as a weapon of warfare in our dark and depraved world, and he would march us out into our world and just produce righteousness. Oh, wouldn't that be amazing? See, you will yield to something. The question is, what are you going to yield to? And you realize that, that we have been loosed. We have been redeemed from the chains and the enslavement to sin. Thus, any sin in our lives must go. Whether it be lust or worry or anxiety or fear or hatred, jealousy, pride, selfishness, lovelessness, gossip, or whatever. See, we must not put a ring in our nose and, and give it over to sin and say, hey, take me wherever you want me to. But get this, in Jesus, sin has no power. It has lost its grip on us unless you yield to it. So what do you do if you find sin in your life? Ask for forgiveness. For his grace is sufficient. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 reminds us that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Romans 6, verse 11, Paul uses the word reckon. He says, likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word reckon is an accounting term, which gives this idea of bringing your life under a new reality. See, this reality, this new reality is true, and you are to decide that you're going to live as if it is. So I bring myself in alignment under this, this new truth. See, it's not that Jesus needs to die again on the cross because I committed a sin. See, it has already been accomplished. The chains are already broken. But would you reckon that truth? Would you bring your life in alignment with it? Would you walk in obedience? And would you allow Jesus to bring about a transformation in your life? In Jesus, you have been forgiven and redeemed. 
forgiven of sin and redeemed or ransomed by the precious blood of Christ. And Paul, back in Ephesians 1, verse 7 and 8, says that this redemption and forgiveness, get this, is according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. And I encourage you, if you haven't listened to the last lesson already, go back and listen to lesson 13, which was about God's amazing grace, where we talk more about this idea of the grace of God. And then after you listen to that lesson, look back at verse 7 and 8 and realize that our forgiveness and our redemption is because of God's grace. And it indeed is rich. So now the question is, would you walk in it? Would you live in this reality of being forgiven and being ransomed by his blood? Well, thank you for joining me for today's study. Next time, we're going to look more at verse 7 and 8 and examine this idea of the richness of God's grace, which God has lavished upon us. And if you'd like to see an outline of this study or read a commentary version of this passage, you can do so by going to deeperchristian.com forward slash Ephesians 14 for lesson 14. And you can also check out all the previous studies in Ephesians by visiting deeperchristian.com forward slash Ephesians. And until next time, know I am cheering you on as you build your life around the one who has given himself fully on your behalf, Jesus Christ. See you then. And you don't have to go very far in the Ten Commandments to realize I have problems. And you realize that even one lie is enough to send us to eternity. <laughs> oh, this whole section is like jumbling my head. Go back. Go back to the that part. <laughs> I'll just redo it. Ah, and it'll be perfect. <coughs> or better. <laughs> this could be a long morning. Now take all of that and come to Romans chapter 6. Doesn't it make sense why Paul would ask the question in verse 1 and 2, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Sorry, I was confined. <laughs> I'm not even reading. It's like my brain just... Oh, uh. <laughs>